Shall we start? Am I audible? Yeah, that's the most common sentence heard these days. So, um, good evening and welcome to session four of the IJR Press Workshop. And we will uh, begin where we um, Shall we start? start last time. Uh, Dr. Goel will be talking about ethical misconduct in publishing. Over to Dr. Goel. Hi, good evening, friends. Um, today we enter the last leg of our journey on this workshop. And uh, trust me, it's been an enjoyable journey so far, walking along uh, with the team. So here, um, let me present a little bit more about scientific misconduct. Once again, welcome to the session. Hello, friends. In this session on scientific misconduct, I'm going to talk about a few things. Data fabrication, falsification, plagiarism, a bit about photo manipulation, duplicate publications, and conflict of interest. So without further ado, let's dive in into fabrication. So what happens uh, in fabrication, which is also called dry labbing, you make up either results, recordings, or report results which were not there. And uh, sometimes people introduce unusual or unreal references to suggest that these are actually authentic results. So you find suddenly that the data is not there, the deadlines are nearing, you need to submit, and you're not sure what next to do. And then you make up the results, you make up the data, you fabricate data. A different kind of misconduct is about data falsification, where you have some data, but there is an attempt to present fictitious or distorted data. It could be data, it could be evidence, it could be references, citations, experimental results, and or you might be knowingly using such material without uh, actually saying that this is so. People manipulate equipment or research materials or processes and even misinterpret the results by sometimes ignoring the outliers or not admitting that some data is missing and they don't include data on the side effects of a clinical trial. All these would fall under falsification. So you have the data, but you don't find the results that you were trying to get or Sometimes you want to please your supervisor or your thesis guide, and you find that the results are not coming out exactly the way that the guide would be happy with. And then you change those data points just to get the right kind of results. That, friends, is data falsification. So obviously, I'm not going to tell you that it's wrong to falsify and it's wrong to fabricate. But let's go into another territory of plagiarism. So plagiarism has got an entire spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum, you might find that there is an unreferenced use of references, or I mean unreferenced use of previously published or unpublished ideas. And at the other end, there is a entire spectrum which transcends through to the other end of the spectrum, where you have the entire submission of a previously published paper in another name, or just change the name of the author and publish it yourself. So everything in between lies under plagiarism. It could be the copying of ideas, processes, results of words without giving appropriate credit. And it's also a subset of it, which is the citation plagiarism, where you willfully forget or you have a negligent failure to appropriately credit the other person or someone who's done this work before you, just to give uh, an improper sense 
of priority or preference or importance to yourself. This is also called citation amnesia or disregard syndrome or even bibliographic negligence. There are different kinds of plagiarism. The most common uh, mistake that we all commit is kind of cut and paste. There's something called patchwork where you borrow phrases and clauses from the original source and without putting them into quotation marks or citing the other author, pass it off as your own work. Then people fall for paraphrasing where you summarize without citing the source. You just change one word here and there using synonyms, but retain the essential thoughts, sentence or structure or style. Most of the times this is unintentional. So all these things could be done unintentionally. And then there is something called self-plagiarism. Self-plagiarism is when you copy without citing from a paper in your own name or your own work in the past and then pass it off as your work again in the future. Now, why would self-plagiarism be a problem? So as uh, in the last session we talked about copyright. So self-plagiarism is an important aspect which violates the copyright of the individual. So once you have published with a publisher or another individual, you may no longer hold the copyright. And once you plagiarize from your own self or from an article which you had written yourself, then it definitely violates the copyright which lies with someone else and you have landed yourself into infringement of copyrights. So how do you avoid plagiarism? The first and the most important thing that you need to be careful about is the intention. If the intention is right, most of the other things will always fall into place. So intentional plagiarism is definitely, definitely, definitely to be avoided. Before you do a work or before you start writing, please ensure that this is your own work. There are several tips that I would like to share with you by the way of which you can avoid unintentional plagiarism. And this is very simple, it's not rocket science. Tip number one, do not copy and paste. So even if you are writing from another paper or if you want to quote from another paper, we have a common uh, instinct. We would copy from somewhere else and paste it into our own article and change the formatting, that's it. It's so simple, however, that's not what you want to do. Please forget copy and paste exists on your computer and please restate and type in your own words. A lot of us are uncomfortable in typing and that's why we adopt the easy route of copying and pasting from another source. But no, please type it back in your own words. That's first tip to avoid plagiarism. Number two, Keep track of the sources that you have consulted and an easy way to do it is to use a referencing software in which you cite where, while you write. That means you cite as you go along. You put in the bibliography and citations as you are writing and do not leave it for later. If you leave it for later, you are bound to miss some of the citations and you would forget where you pick this up from. So it's always, always better to use a referencing software, a reference manager software, like I spoke in one of the previous sessions, and you cite as you write. Tip number three, paraphrase and write your own ideas. It, it follows from the first one, where you do not copy and paste, and you restate things in your own words, and you would paraphrase and add your own ideas. So if you quote from another source, please give credit wherever it is due. Please do not feel shy of giving credit or acknowledging another worker or another researcher who's done this and said this before you. If you are quoting from a review article, if you have read a systematic review and you would want to quote one of the studies which is included in that review article, please remember this is not a good idea. You should be crediting the original author or the original study, and you should not be citing secondary references. The primary reference is that particular author and that original study. It's not this review article. 
So you also always need to credit the original author and the text of your article and also in the reference list. And finally, you should always use a plagiarism check software. But please also remember that once you use a plag, plag check software or a plagiarism checking software, you get a false sense of security, which is not required. The most important thing is that your intention needs to be correct. And if your intention is correct, do not copy and paste, use a reference manager software and cite as you write, and do not quote from a review article. Go back to the original study and quote from there. And finally, use a plagiarism check software. So this is the most important slide in my today's presentation. And I have delved on this at greater length and spent the most amount of time in the entire presentation on this particular slide, because I realized that a lot of young authors fall into this trap and find it easy to get into this trap and then it's always so difficult to get out of it once you've fallen into it. So here is a list of uh, some free and some paid plagiarism software that are available out there and you could use any one of them and this is not a comprehensive list and there are several other softwares that are available and you could use practically any one of them. One question that we are often asked is what is the usual cutoff? How much should the black check software identify or what is the usual cutoff which will be taken? So there is no such cutoff. However, I have taken this from one of the journals which says that if the black check software flags about 15%, we would accept it, anything under 15%. If it's between 16 to 30%, we would invite the authors to revise. If it's between 31 to 50%, we would outrightly reject the article. And if the plagiarism check software flags more than 50% of the material, then we reject. And we also ask the authors for an explanation why they submitted to this manuscript, uh, this journal, and why they had so much of a plagiarism in their article. So please be careful. These are only indicative cutoffs, and they are definitely not the thumb rule and they're not uh, followed by all journals across the board. The most important is your intention. So there's a fine line which separates plagiarism and copyright infringement, which is, uh, as we discussed in the previous session also, plagiarism is when you don't say where you took it from, whereas copyright infringement is when you take it without permission. And it happens to be this purple area of intersection when you take it without permission and try to pass it off as your own work. At this point, I would like to bring in something like uh, the license for use. So what uh, we often tend to do is that we would do a Google search. Supposing we are trying to make a presentation, we would do a Google search and we uh, find different images and we would copy those images into our presentation. For example, I have copied this image here, which says Creative Commons or CC into my presentation. Now, this could be a copyright infringement or this could be plagiarism. However, when you search for Google, under the tools, you would find that there are different kinds of licenses which are associated with each image or each file. There are some which are labeled for non-commercial use. There are some which are labeled for non-commercial reuse with modification. There are some which are labeled for reuse and some which are labeled for reuse with modification. <coughs> so when you are using images of Google, please remember that you need to check what license it has been listed under and follow only those which are labeled for non-commercial reuse or reuse with modification, depending upon how you want to use that image so that you do not fall into this copyright trap. Okay, the next topic we're going to talk about is photo manipulation and I would finish this um, in a couple of minutes. I can see the frowns on um, the organizers faces because I'm exceeding my time, but another two minutes and I'll wind this up. So in the recent times, there has been an increased usage of photo editing software, but please remember when you are using images, manipulation is not permitted for the following, following things. 
you cannot splice together different images to represent a single experiment. You can change brightness and contrast if you are changing the entire image's contrast and brightness, but you can't change the contrast and brightness of only one part of the image so as to modify the signal intensity and give an impression of a different uh, image than what was actually recorded in the experiment. If you are showing only a very small part of the photo so that additional information is not visible, that is not acceptable. Any change that conceals information, even when it is considered to be non-specific, is not acceptable in, in many journals. So please be careful while you are taking pictures of clinical material for presentation or for use in your articles. A word on duplicate publications. So duplication is uh, when you try to republish the same findings or you try to submit one to one or more journals simultaneously, or it might be salami publications. So as you would see, this is a picture which shows what is a salami. So if you divide one research project into many small papers, that again is not considered good science and good scientific practice and is something that you definitely want to avoid in early parts of your careers. And finally, a word about conflict of interest. So to define it, it's professional judgment con uh, concerning the primary interest of the study, which uh, relates to the validity of the study. So if your professional judgment concerning the primary interest of study comes in conflict or is unduly influenced by the secondary interest, by another secondary interest, such as a financial gain, or it may be anything that may just give that impression. So anything under this gamut comes into conflict of interest. And anything, remember, which if revealed to the reader later, which, may, which will make a reasonable reader feel misled or deceived, will all come under conflict of interest. And you do not want to give that impression. It's not necessary that conflict of interest may be financial. It could be personal, it could be political, it could be academic, it could be commercial, or it could be personal. So please remember that you need to carefully analyze your conflict of interest, understand that the validity of study is not affected by either a personal, commercial, political, academic, or financial gain, which could lead to a conflict of interest for yourself. And with this, I would come to the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you for your patient attention. And um, over to Dr. Latika. Thank you, Dr. Goel, for the lovely talk. Now we'll uh, move on to the second talk for the day. That is social media and academia. So we come to the slightly offbeat topic today and how it can make a difference to your career. And no disclosures. So before we venture onto the topic, uh, let me tell you the structure. We'll quickly run through the various kinds of social media platforms, the metrics that can be used. Uh, what are researcher profiles, uh, the tips and tricks of the trade, and the academic misadventures which you would not like to be a part of. So what are these platforms that social media uh, comprises of? We are all familiar, I suppose, with Twitter and Facebook. In India, these are popular, and also Twitter is big all around the world. Then uh, there are some more academic specific um, social media channels like uh, Mendeley, ResearchGate, and LinkedIn. Uh, in Eastern Europe, we have uh, other social media portals like uh, We Contacte, Onlooplus Niki, and WhatsApp is big in India. It's used uh, largely for personal communication, but uh, the line between personal and professional is getting blurred by the day. WeChat is more popular in China. So this brings us to the question, why do we want to use social media for academia? So the distinctive advantages of uh, this model of Primarily borderless communication, as we can see today, all of us are here and connected. And those of us who are not able to join on time are going to catch us on live stream and uh, recordings later. So this is uh, the realm of borderless communication. And the world is a smaller place with the use of these social media tools. 
And also it's very convenient. You can be sitting in the comfort of your homes or in the office or taking break between different meetings and you quickly tweet about something. And at the same time, you're connecting with researchers across the world. Also, it is rapid and efficient. So uh, that adds a special flavor. And uh, needless to say, this old mantra of um, publish or perish may very soon be replaced by um, be found or perish in this uh, digital age. So everything is pretty much moved online. Researchers have moved online. Libraries are now more of digital libraries. I'd say lives are being lived online too. And uh, also to answer this question, we may need to boil down to the basics. Like why are we conducting research? Uh, it may be because we have a hypothesis in our mind. Uh, it is a riddle which is bothering you. Okay, maybe this pathway is more operative in COVID-19 pathogenesis, or maybe that one, maybe we can target that. Or it's just a means to an end. Um, suppose you just want to uh, publish papers for academic growth. Uh, or you want to improve existent methods. So suppose there's a laboratory technique to check anti-nuclear antibodies and you want to describe a better technique, which is faster, which doesn't require so much expertise, or there's an ELISA kit, which you have available in India, which you want to test, or for career growth. So either ways, uh, any researcher, they have um, a specific responsibility to communicate and uh, there are different realms of communication. One is within the academia, we want to communicate and colleagues uh, regarding the papers and we do that uh, by means of conferences or webinars as we're doing today but then there's also a sense of responsibility which we should carry um, for the society and uh, this uh, primarily is reflected uh, in terms of uh, events or maybe um, blogs which share information on research so we see that a lot these days that uh, something uh, comes up and it's remarkable research, especially in the era of COVID-19, then uh, blogs will pick it up and a lot of lay public will resort to that kind of information. Also news channels feature information and then social media is the big game, which we will come to in a minute. For examples, we conduct a systematic review of smartphone apps uh, available for coronavirus disease. And um, so whom do we need to inform of this research? We uh, conducted literature search and went through the apps in India, United States and UK. And we want to tell people which app is the best. So we have a clear message here, which is very important, which needs to be conveyed. And as much as the healthcare workers, even the lay public needs to know. And such news gets featured on Center of Disease Control website, because this is of prime importance to the lay public. It also gets tweeted and gets uh, viewed around 1500 times and the PDF downloaded over 350 times. So, so this is how research can uh, be important. There are different kinds of research and you may need to communicate and social media is the best tool for that. Now, before we go on further, let uh, me uh, run you through the various kind of metrics in academia. So bibliometrics, if you're a big fan of citations, so that is what bibliometrics is all about. Uh, so you publish a paper and your paper gets cited in another paper. So for those of you who've conducted research, you would know how tedious and um, um, time taking that process is. Uh, today, you write a paper, writing takes ages, collecting that data takes ages, and then it undergoes peer review and comes online, even post publication uh, processing. Uh, it takes time. So these take time to accumulate and we'll talk more about this in the future slides. And webometrics is when your URL link, so some your paper is present on a particular URL link and how many times that URL link is accessed by another link. So that is webometrics, which can also give you an indication of how much your research is being accessed. And then the usage metrics like downloads, uh, visits or reads like we talked about uh, in the previous slide. And then there's alt metrics, which we'll go over later. So the declaration of research assessment, uh, the meeting is conducted in San Francisco. They also recommend that uh, journal-based metrics need to, uh, to be replaced or complemented. I wouldn't use a strong word like eliminate, but definitely there's a felt need for a range of performance measures, which includes all metrics. So why do we need new metrics? Mainly because uh, as we talked about it, peer review is slow and inefficient. If someone else wants to cite your paper, it's going to take ages. Uh, you all would have been reviewers at some point. You know you're busy in your lives. It takes time and then revisions take time. So it's a very slow process and current world is really fast paced. 
And then we have citations, which are limited only to those people who write. So of the 200 people who registered for this uh, conference, how many would write? Not many would write. So I am publishing this research, for example, in smartphone apps, but not everyone is going to write a research paper, yet they may use those apps. So uh, using only citations as a metric of success of that publication or of the utility may be inappropriate. Also impact factor, as Dr. Goel talked about previously, can be easily manipulated and these metrics are uh, carrying their own fallacies and are prone to abuse. So um, the wider impact on the scientific community, if we were to measure it, we would look at the downloads, tweets, uh, we can uh, look at its use in educated material. So this brings us to all metrics. It's basically attention to research from the non-traditional sources like policy documents, news, blogs, uh, social media. And it's an indicator of research impact and also um, it complements, but does not replace traditional metrics, uh, which is the most important thing to be remembered after today's talk. So the broader attention is captured from a wide range of different um, sources. And also, uh, if you look at the scientific cycle of attention to research, uh, one is months and years, that is citation, the traditional metrics. But if you look at the today's world, which is fast paced, all metrics, you have an article published within two minutes, it can be on social media, you tweet about it, your friends tweet about it, and then your colleagues tweet about it. And, and then it's noticed if you put, use hashtags, we look at the strategies uh, further. So uh, maybe researchers in similar fields who are interested in that kind of research, they get attend, they watch it and then they retweet it. So it gets attention and over days, the alt metrics build up and gather more and more momentum. And since people are reading it, so not all people will subscribe to all journals. Some people may just be on Twitter and they notice your research and they know about it. For example, just last week I was writing a review article and uh, I wanted to talk about um, the articles on coronavirus disease and myositis. But when I did a PubMed search, sometimes our searches may not be uh, perfect. So nothing, I could get nothing, literally nothing. But then I remember there were a few articles which I found on Twitter and I ended up citing them. So of course, if learned people go through your research, they will cite it, but uh, they have to first go through it and notice it, which can happen very quickly through social media. Also a high online visibility of an article, it has the potential to draw attention not only to the researcher, but also to the study and the journal. So this is a responsibility we have uh, uh, towards the journal as well. And for that, various journals are these days having social media uh, accounts and social media editors are uh, involved for the same. So this term, altmetrics, this fancy term just came up by fluke. Uh, this a gentleman known as uh, Jason Prim, he um, used this in a tweet way back in 2010. And after that, this became the official term for article level alternate metrics. And uh, this gentleman went on to, uh, to be the co-founder at Impact Story, which is another um, portal for alt metrics. And uh, it offers the added advantage of um, generating research profiles and um, you can uh, get your CV there. It just, it will sample the World Wide Web for all information on you and it will put it up there, synthesize it in a beautiful format, you can download it and it adds credibility. So if you have your CV and you add a researcher profile from Impact Story or another such portal, it shows that it's already been verified, it's generated with someone else, you're not putting up there, no one needs to really check if it's there or not. So uh, altmetrics, uh, there are various portals, uh, most common is altmetrics.com, which is popular and we'll talk about it at greater length. But then there were various others like Plum X. Also, you might have heard of the PLOS journals. So this journal group also provides article level metrics specifically for the articles published on their platform. So this has been there for quite a while, but then it's specific to this publisher group. And then Impact Story, which I mentioned about. But then there are also aggregators, which you should not confuse with alt metrics. So these are basically portals where um, the uh, research is aggregated and available all together. I think in India, ResearchGate is popular and many of you may be familiar. For those of you who are joining us from overseas, uh, you may be uh, more uh, comfortable with Mendeley or academia.edu. So these two are also popular with social sciences and the other scientific backgrounds. And then there are many others. 
So um, you may have seen this altmetric donor at times, and um, it's time you got to know about it. So uh, the advantage of this altmetric donor is it's real time. So today it's seven, tomorrow two friends tweet, or maybe two hours later it'll be eight or nine. So if the score goes up, it's real time, it's monitoring and sampling all that data out there on the internet. It also gives you context. So it's not just a, a donut, colorful and uh, looking nice, um, pleasing the senses, no. So each of these carry some meaning. So each of these uh, demonstrate where it was noticed so these are specific sources where your uh, article may have been uh, shared. So blue, the color of Twitter, is the one you'll see most often. And then uh, we'll go over it in a minute. And then broadness. So it covers a wide range of, uh, uh, it samples a wide range of sources, as you can see. And also the breadth of each of these, it signifies how much is the volume through each of them. So just at a glance, you can get a good idea if it's all blue and it's blue is broad, so it's like only shared on Twitter. But then um, depending on how many colors you see and the breadth, you know that if it is just red, maybe it was a policy document or it was somewhere else in the newspaper. So that is how it reflects diversity and it's also open and quick. So it may be the only metric for young researchers. Suppose I have a student who just started publishing and we should publish two papers since January. So this will be the only metric they will have. Suppose they go and apply for a job so they can show that, oh, my article did really well on social media. This is the old metric donut. And you can post that on your CV. And uh, so this is a quick list. Um, of the sources sampled by the Altmetric Donut. It was basically a London-based startup set up by Yuan Adi in 2011. And uh, look at the brilliance, the wide variety of sources, uh, Google Plus, patents. So patents are important, right? News, the red is news, and then Wikipedia. So all of it you see in one go. And if you're a researcher who wants to know what are people talking about my research and you're really curious, then it can tell you apart from the breakup of your research and its uh, social media success, it'll also give you a geographic distribution of where your um, the people interested in your research are based. So you can know if you were just local or you actually went global. And uh, apart from that, altmetric.com also offers various other uh, facilities, like you get the altmetric uh, book, bookmarklet. So this is basically a browser plugin. Uh, you can see the altmetric data for any publication. You just hover over it, and you can see, once you've downloaded this, you can see quickly what are the altmetric scores. And then you have the altmetric batches. So again, uh, you can embed them, you download them uh, into individual profiles. It'll tell you your altmetric score, your article's altmetric score, and then the altmetric API. So API is like a PubMed database. So you go and query the PubMed database for the various articles, but you can also go to the API and look at the articles based on their altmetric scores. And you can only imagine that they'll be very different from what you obtain on um, PubMed or other search engines. So this is a unique thing. And uh, the various articles being published these days querying the API database, depending on the article API scores. And apart from that, we also have Plum Analytics. Um, this is another such uh, portal which offers um, the unique uh, advantage of measuring what was not measurable before. So suppose you are a novice researcher and you've just published two articles and tomorrow you want to go apply for a grant. You have nothing to write in your CV, but you had done some amazing clinical research and uh, this research has changed practice. So there is a document uh, in your hospital which says that from now on, maybe suppose clinical examination will be done this way or maybe this is how things will be conducted. So definitely your um, uh, research was impactful, but how do we measure it? So PlumX does that. Um, so what impact has our research had in the past 12 months? So this specifically measures that, it'll sample the World Wide Web for all the information and clinical impact. So this is specific to PlumX. So it'll sample uh, if your papers are part of a policy document or a guideline or any kind of clinical impact. So it is very good and designed to pick that up. And for early career research, granted is excellent because 
suppose you are a young researcher and you just started out, you won't have your own laboratory. You know, laboratory research typically does way better than clinical research. And for every kind of clinical research, it's usually based on some kind of laboratory research. So before any clinical research can be cited, there'll be at least four to five citations for the basic research. But if you're a young researcher and you don't have generous uh, colleagues, senior colleagues, then you may not be able to do any lab research. And uh, so clinical impact is what you need and PlumX may really help you in such a case. And um, further, the metrics here are slightly different than all metrics, like you have usage, uh, citation, social media, mentions and captures, and this is the typical uh, appearance of a PlumX tool. Uh, usage involves clicks, views, downloads, library holdings, captures is a more important, they say that this is more closely related to um, citations later on, it correlates because, so, so this is if someone bookmarks your research or has marked it as favorite or has saved it, so it's more likely they're gonna go back to it, they wanna really refer to it again and they may cite it. And then mentions like the blog posts and Wikipedia and social media is separate, which makes sense. And then the citations. This includes patent citations and clinical citations and policy citations, which are very sensible measures which are missing from the other old metric tools. So um, for those of you who are big fans of citations, we come to the obvious question that uh, does an old metric score correlate with citation? Okay, my article has been tweeted, so what? So there are various studies every now and then, maybe every month at least I see one study on this that what is a correlation. I've seen articles in rheumatology, articles in immunology. Some say yes, some say no. So why is it? Why is there so much heterogeneity in the results? Because, so if you recall the altmetric donut, it samples um, your article's visibility from various different sources. So it depends where your article is being noticed. If it is on Mendeley, Mendeley is uh, primarily comprised by academicians, even at thousand, we will uh, probably talk about it later. It is a curated community of academicians, which could be further stratified as uh, um, basic scientists, laboratory scientists, uh, life scientists, social sciences. So, uh, so these are the people sitting out there in their offices and they are churning out research papers and if they are reading it of course they're going to cite it because that's all that's quite a lot uh, what the job is all about but if it is uh, noticed on maybe news outlets or policy documents or blogs then no it will not translate into citations so people have shown clearly that uh, if your research is being noticed on amid academicians uh, in academic communities, then clearly they would uh, be cited more. Further on, if you want funding, um, so that can be a problem, like we are in this era of precision medicine and this is like precision funding. So uh, Plumex can integrate with your funding opportunity. It can show you prompts for uh, what is a right funding opportunity for you. And uh, it can also inform the funding uh, agencies of your availability. Further, it also offers feedback from peers and also from funding agencies, which helps in growth. So feedback is always good for uh, growth. So basically uh, the gist is we have different tools and you need to know which tool to use for the right score, like old metrics is for uh, visibility, PlumX is more for research funding. And then we have impact story, which we did not really go into, but then it tells you some unique things like highly recommended, if your article was highly cited and then highly discussed, you know, this discussed is very important because if you pick someone's in, uh, curiosity, it's likely it's uh, going to um, stay around in their memory for a longer time. and. Uh, also, it's good for hypothesis generation, and if you want to think, uh, especially post-publication uh, peer review, uh, it'll help uh, if your article is discussed and you maybe leads to further research. A word of caution, because uh, you need to select the type of metric based on the impact you're investigating, and metrics in general should not trump peer review, they should only complement it. and. Um, they, if you're measuring societal impact, uh, it depends on what kind of metric you're using. You can't go to F1000 prime reviews, which is primarily uh, comprised by researchers because it'll not tell you societal impact. So you need to be very careful where you're playing your game and uh, trying to look at your metrics. 
And remember, numbers don't tell you the quality of the paper, the quality of the researcher, or the entire story. It may be just be popular with um, the lay public, but it may be retracted later. So it's not the entire story. You need to go deeper into it and organize your thoughts and analyze what you want to make out of it. Apart from that, uh, social media is useful not only to assert your value, to benchmark your career progress, and this is mainly for researcher profiles, uh, you can also use them to communicate more effectively. So if you were to ask me, okay, I'm not a social media person, and please tell me just one social media platform that I want to use. I don't want to be on social media. So I'd say that I'd put my money on Twitter. It's really big in academia these days. And um, so uh, the Twitter game is not as simple as it seems. So there are different kind of people who tweet. Uh, and it has been shown uh, clearly by research, the citations accumulate based on specific kind of Twitter engagements. So what are the disseminators or the mumblers who just you know retweet everything? And one of the broadcasters, they just retweet a lot of stuff. So it, a lot of junk, but this may not necessarily translate into citations. And then there are the um, orators who discuss your research. So today I published this, suppose you published with smartphone apps and someone asked, okay, which app did you find the best? Because we just tweeted about it that, oh, we conduct a systematic review, but someone wants to discuss it. And then they tag another person and a third person, and then it becomes a thread. And the more it is, uh, uh, becomes a thread, more people are tagged, the engagement increases, and then the visibility goes up. It's like it spreads, you know. So uh, that correlates with citations the most, especially if it's discussed, it's remembered, and it's analyzed, and it's, you know, digged into. And then there are the influencers. So if you're Eric Topol, who has like a zillion followers, and has written a book, and then he tweets about all the awesome stuff, then if he tweets your stuff, then definitely it gets noticed. So that is another thing. And um, so which article made a bigger impact? So articles with many citations, maybe I've uh, been successful at changing your viewpoint slightly, even articles which are widely discussed in the social web or those who have a lot of downloads or which are discussed on networks, they also have some kind of success, maybe a different kind of success, but it is success nevertheless. So um, I'd say if you want to start with Twitter today, uh, maybe you can um, devote five to 10 minutes of your valuable time every day. And there are various techniques. It's not a simple game. It's not just like you talk about, or you say whatever you want. You've got just 140 characters there. So it's a limited space and you want your tweet to be visible. It's a big community. So many people are tweeting every day. Donald Trump is tweeting. People are going to follow him. They won't follow you. So you can use hashtags because in that uh, big uh, collection of information, you want your information to get a particular um, be allotted to a particular domain. So you can talk about rheumatology. Suppose you're uh, tweeting about rheumatology, then you always mention rheumatology as a hashtag. Hashtag is a pound sign, uh, which we use before words. And to reduce words, how I do it is like if I create a tweet, I use it right before the word so that some people like to mention specific terms at the end of the tweet. That is another way to do it. Then mentions, like I said, that if people uh, you tag people, then it is noticed. And um, it goes, uh, basically their contact will also see it or this person was tagged, so the network spreads. And then engagement, yes, engagement is how we discuss. Like I talked about, you ask someone a question that, hey, we published this, what do you think about it? And it could be someone sitting in the United States. And then if you pull out your altmetric scores, you'll see, you know, you're just tweeted in the United States and in India. And then you can collaborate. So there's DM, direct messaging or personal messaging. You can also do that on Twitter. And you have to say more with less. So you have a very tiny character limit. And how do you do it? Sometimes the links are huge and they occupy all of your tweets. So you can use something known as a tiny URL or bit URL so that you can Google about it. These are websites which shorten your link. And you can also sometimes customize your link. So suppose you want to create a, a link on smartphone apps. So you can make it like smartphone.url. You know, it looks cool. And then there's something called RT, modified RT, so retweet. So you just retweet someone. So you can, it, it, there is an option called retweet and you just click that. But if you modified it, it is your moral responsibility to say it's a modified retweet. And then there are journal clubs. You can host a journal club on Twitter, which increases engagement. You discuss an article or some uh, journals um, use bots. So bots can really spam your accounts and you need to be wary of those. And uh, 
if you are a social media editor or if you're just um, handling a lot of accounts, then you can sometimes use Hootsuite or TweetDeck. So they have the unique advantage that you can sync different social media profiles. Like I want to create this tweet about this article and I want it to go on Facebook, on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Oh my God, I don't want to go in three times, you know, like put that post, no. So you go to Hootsuite and you sync these three accounts and the advantage you can also schedule your posts. So I sit today for an hour and I schedule posts for the entire week. And time zoning is another technique. So you want to be noticed all around the world. So you create one tweet for 8 a.m., one for 10 a.m. and one for 12 and distribute it all along the day. So you're in the daylight time for different zones around the world. And then you can do Twitter courses, which are available on various platforms. And people have shown that social media and peer reviewed readership um, using personal accounts for tweeting definitely increases engagement. So even when a journal has a social media editor, they will want the social media editor and other authors to tweet because it's all about a network. A single person cannot do much. Uh, some uh, tips on how to create a profile on Twitter. So these are the rules of the game. Uh, upload a profile picture. It should be clear, ideally not uh, like this. It should be more clear. And then you need to add a background photo which should not clash with your picture. And then add your real name. So this is a tendency a lot of people have, especially those who hate social media that we like, oh no, I'm not putting my real name, but you have to put your real name because you need to be noticed by the right people, by the colleagues and they need to identify you and your research. So even I had a cryptic name before this until I changed it to my real name. And then you add a location, people, uh, it's again incorrect, but then yeah, you need to add the correct location. You can add a URL to your personal website. So if you've written a book, you can put the link to that. Uh, if you, it's a professional community, so you can put a link to your research gate or your LinkedIn, but yeah, not to your personal account usually, unless you want unnecessary attention. Then add a bio, this is the most important part. So you need to tell people what you are, like you talk and you're a rheumatologist, maybe you want other rheumatologist to find you. So you can add a hashtag before that, all the Twitter has this inbuilt thing. If you have a room, room thing in your profile anywhere, you'll see people even if they don't add a hashtag. And then I'm a social media editor. I want other social media editors to find me. So this is the acronym for a social media editor. And then I've used it with a pound sign as a hashtag so that these people can find you and you can collaborate if needed. And then you add the journals that you are uh, standing for because this adds to your credibility, you know, transparency. You say that, okay, those journal treats are being handled by me. So if there's any problem, you know, accounts can get hacked or sometimes there can be an error. So you want people to be able to get in touch with you. And then if you're doing research on particular areas, you want people to know that. So it's just a profile is just lying there. Who's going to know what, what are you doing about? You may be publishing on 10 different topics, but one may be your area of interest. And it's a matter of years before you go on to that topic only and you stop everything else. So you want these people to find you right now. And that's why you put the appropriate hashtags and put it out there on your profile so the right people can come and find you. And then the theme color, which is not uh, so relevant and the birthday again, which you probably do not need to share over there. And uh, the answer advantage is sometimes like journals, uh, for example, the Journal of Clinical Rheumatology, it offers free access. It's a paid journal, but sometimes some articles are free as part of promotion. So they set free a particular article for a fortnight and you can read it and then you get feedback so post publication peer review like i talked about the most discussed articles and you get new ideas when you talk with people and then um, it can fuel further research and you also have this analytic tools which you may like to go through uh, on your personal uh, profiles which tell you how much of the impressions and the engagement is how many people actually went through it and the tweets top tweets and then usually the trend is that uh, it there is a tweet with pictures, then it usually does better. And those with hashtags or those who tag other accounts. So you may want to tag other people, friends, or those who may be interested. Facebook also offers these insights. So the another advantage is you can see the time of the day when your posts are actually doing better. So you can uh, uh, circulate your tweets and your posts around that time. So, uh, you know, you don't want to circulate at 4 a.m. in India where no one will be up. You want to circulate it at the time when people are most active. So you see like 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. people are actually on Facebook. And then again, after 9 p.m. there's another peak. So you want to make use of this time and create posts and schedule them in this time period. 
And as we all know, pictures speak a thousand words. So infographics is uh, another important part of social media promotions. Uh, you want to use pictures for your uh, tweets or social media posts because there's more information packed there. It's visually appealing and it's retained better in your memory. And ideally, an infographic is more structured. It's not just any random picture, but it will take your eyes on a predefined journey. It has curated the information and synthesized it in a way that you like to see it. And it sends a clear message. Uh, it is accurate. Accuracy is something you should need to be very careful about because social media is an open game and then everything is out there and can be recorded and you don't want to be misquoted or misunderstood. So uh, there are various user groups on Twitter. Like you can see, this is the academic circle where they talk of university, science, and then director, school, department, professor. And then there's topics and collectives. Like, so this is the academic, depending on where you're placed. And this is the topic based, like research, education, health, person. And then this is personal, you know, like food or like writing, love scientists so their life so there's these are different realms altogether you want your tweet to go into the right category you know like i'm tweeting about um covid19 research um something which is very laboratory based you know which is not of relevance uh a t cell profiling in covid19 so i don't want people from my uh if I'm living in New Delhi, surrounded by non-academicians, I don't want my tweet to go there to my neighbors, right? So you need to use the appropriate hashtags and make sure that you are in the right circle and your bio helps and also the hashtags you use and how you curate that tweet over there. And um, public is actually, if you want to be famous and you want to be uh, having a lo lot of followers, then maybe uh, you, know, you want to be in the public realm. Uh, it depends on the content, of course. And then uh, there are various uses of social media. You can have patient support groups, there are patient support communities, you can have access to them. If you're working on a rare disease, you can actually reach out to those people and uh, talk to them, understand their problems, uh, communicate, collaborate. There's so many things which can be done, especially for rare diseases, especially for initiating patient support groups so they are felt and heard and um, can make use of the situation and your presence out there. So uh, social media uh, is being used for various purposes now, even for telehealth, where ancillary services are being provided with great convenience in the comfort of your home. Uh, people are really looking at it uh, as a resource for AI. So there are a lot of papers coming up on artificial intelligence based uh, data mining protocols, which just um, analyze tweets and geosensed and time uh, stamped tweets can give you a lot of information, including prediction of a COVID-19 outbreak in a particular community. So a lot of papers on that, and it can be a useful resource when used in the right way. And uh, this is also a financially sustainable model, but here we uh, need to remember that uh, our tweets need to be curated in the right way. And if you are using pictures, then they'll have higher engagement and higher impressions. So you are more efficient at what you're trying to do. Also smartphone apps are being used. Uh, so that is again, connecting with people and uh, with patients. So these can be then linked and synced into um, databases. And uh, we may later come into the realm of teletriage and patient reported outcomes in the future. And uh, researcher profiles are very important because it gives credibility to your uh, content. People, it are also a reflection of your work. It shows what are your areas of interest. So your collaborators will come to you. You can get more funding. You can get CV badges, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. So it's better to invest time if you're a young researcher, particularly it may be a strong find foundation for the future. Like Publons is uh, it typically for reviews more, it does offer a wide range of services, but mostly for uh, review. So if you are a reviewer to various journals, you may want to send the thank you note from the journal saying that you've reviewed to Publons. And then it creates, it gathers all the information and keeps a record for you. And then if you've also got some peer review awards, so it's a thankless process getting reviews, but, but a pub launch rewards you with some sort of um, uh, awards, which you can add to your profile, to your CV and really enhances um, your um, bio data. 
and then uh, you can also download like you can uh, export the pub launch cv which shows how many articles you have uh, reviewed and for with journals so you know it's verified so that really adds weight to your cv if you just attach what pub launch says rather than you know like saying things for yourself and then you can also download your uh, cv F1000 is uh, something we did talk about earlier. It is a curated community of researcher, it includes medicine, workspace, and specialty. So it is stratified by different interests. And in workspace, you can collaborate and interact and you know, gain much more from a community of your own kind. So if I were to give you some homework today, I'd say register on RCID, uh, import your work. So RCID is a unique identifier number which links all your research. And uh, because you may have a common name, you know, Latika Gupta, there are so many Latika Guptas. Uh, so you don't know which one is that. So RCID will link all the research to your name and your identity. And then you can go to Impact Story. I'll say you link your CV or email signature. So that is another cool thing you could do. And then uh, you may have an account on ResearchGate. If not, then in better late than never. And then Mendeley and Google Scholar. Uh, Facebook could be a personal uh, space, depending. And you can uh, sometimes there are option of creating two profiles, a public and a professional one. Twitter is usually professional, it's better to keep it that way. And you could try getting the altmetric tab and explore which articles actually did better on social media. It's something which may uh, be of curiosity to you. And then uh, always remember to be mindful of the fact that uh, there are various pitfalls. There's a lot of information floating around there. You don't want yourself to spread any misinformation. You yourself don't want to be a victim of the infodemic and get misinformation and be misinformed. You don't want to create chaos by spamming people with a lot of posts. It is also important to not be misinterpreted. So always double check what you're saying. Data ownership is very important. Like Dr. Goyal talked about it, never quote someone else's data. And uh, you have to be sure also copyright is another very important aspect. So if you transfer the copyright to the journal, you need to make sure that the author has the permissions to share it on social media. If it is just a part of the paper, then maybe it's fine. But if it is the entire paper you're putting out there, like on ResearchGate, you really need to check who the copyright lies with. And then if you're sharing patient images, it's extremely important to uh, um, uh, make sure that there's no breach of uh, patient privacy. Consent has been taken and identifiers um, are blocked, so you cannot identify the patient in the picture. And of course, like there are technological failures everywhere, like we had it last time. So um, you have to be mindful of that. Uh, for example, last year we hosted a conference and the Twitter account went out. It just got blocked uh, two days before the conference. So you always have to be ready and prepared for the uncertain and the anti-fragile in your endeavors. So take home for today, the social media presence can boost academic performance and um, unconventional metrics are in, so better get used to them. Uh, you should endorse borderless communication, especially in the post COVID era, which has made the world a smaller place. You could collaborate through social media uh, activities and always be wary of academic misadventures and uh, to not land yourself in trouble. Thank you. So this brings us to the end of my lecture. And next, we will have Dr. Vinod Ravindran for the next talk. Thanks, Latika. I think uh, Dr. Durga needs to leave, so maybe we could have him first. I will go first because I had to leave. Sorry. Uh, or, or uh, you know, I can drop down if you want me to. Uh, Dr. Durga, what do you prefer? Okay, maybe you could go first, yeah. Sorry.
Yeah, Dr. Ravindran, go ahead. You start. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just because, you know, what we advertised, uh, um, Okay, yeah, let me crack on. Um, good evening, um, everyone, once again. Uh, okay, so let me bring back, bring all of you back to the reality. Um, uh, because your credibility as an author or researcher is actually based on the amount of uh, you know good quality research you publish it is not based on uh, whatever said and done uh, uh, the social media pushing of articles it is uh, agreed that uh, you know it may be helping in the citations and all that but essentially we are not uh, um, we are not we are authors, researchers, or academicians. We are not um, businessmen, and we are not actually selling the commodities. So I'll come back to this uh, a bit later on. But anyway, uh, this is basically my perspectives of you know how to how the manuscript is uh, handled, and uh, based on its outcome. Uh, uh, whether it is a revision, a rejection. Um, you know, what type of sort of, you know, further course of actions can be taken by the authors, okay? Um, and this is largely based on my experience uh, uh, editing this journal for the last two and a half years. Uh, this is a journal for the general uh, physicians, as you all know. And then recently I joined uh, a large uh, well-supported team of Rheumatology Oxford as an associate editor, but this experience is also, I mean, it is just building up, you can say. And before that, um, um, with the Indian General of Rheumatology, first as an as associate editor, then as the editor-in-chief um, before uh, Dr. Virak Sagarwal. So a disclaimer would be whatever I um, speak now, is actually based on um, uh, uh, real and personal experiences, often including of Dr. Agarwal, if I can say so. So as an author, uh, researcher, there might be a lot of reasons why you consider a particular journal for submitting your work. Okay. But once it is submitted, um, then, of course, it is helpful to understand uh, how a manuscript is processed and then sort of, you know, develop the tools or the approaches which will help you in dealing with uh, the outcomes of a review process or a peer review process. And lastly, if your manuscript is rejected, how to deal with those rejections. So once you have submitted, um, this has been covered before selecting the right journal already covered, um, but, but this is actually your first step towards avoiding rejections, I would say, that you must consider the type of paper carefully and obey the instructions to the authors verbatim, including the word counts, numbers of figures, tables, references, Whatever they want, just give it to them. Don't make uh, these technical matters um, uh, become a barrier to, uh, you know, either a delayed processing or, or outright rejection of your manuscript. So a manuscript can be handled in several different ways. Uh, the most uh, widely used workflow is the workflow four here. 
author submits and after the preliminary checks by the editorial assistant, um, it is passed on to the chief editor who assigns, selects and assigns it to the associate editor and then associate editor uh, invite reviewers or reviewer, uh, depending on the type of manuscript. And once the process starts, it ends by reviewer uh, handing in their or turning in their uh, reviews. Um, and, and, and the edi associate editor will uh, go through all that and with his or her own recommendation pass it on to the editor in chief for the final decision. So this is the, the most common workflow uh, which is adopted across the journals. Including the uh, including the engineer of rheumatology and the, the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. Um, workflow zero, where author submits and uh, you know there is no associate editor is involved. This is basically for very very small journals if, if there are any remaining. But this workflow uh, can be adopted when the editor in chief handles a manuscript himself or herself. Um, so this is so mostly it is uh, workflow four, and sometimes it is workflow zero. In a lot of journal, uh, this AE assignment is done by the, uh, the the editorial assistants because you would have given you have been you would have given. Uh, the keywords relating to the area of your uh, interest as an associate editor. And uh, looking at that, the admin can actually assign the associate editors the manuscripts. And then EIC is not involved at this stage. Now, the second process is basically the review. So the question comes at what decides the ultimate fate of your paper? So these are two um, components, two critical factors. One is the editorial review and the second is the peer review. Editorial review is the most critical aspect of manuscript processing because the editorial uh, overview of your manuscript is the paramount and this is the binding decision or everybody related to the journal. The editor looks at the overall scope of the journal, the need of such manuscripts to come in, its importance to the, to the uh, readership uh, of that particular journal, and whether the manuscript, the work itself has got any relevance uh, in terms of the journal's uh, scope, reach, and acceptable. So, but the editors wants to be diplomatic. So the language which is often used by the editor at this stage is that uh, you must have seen this, that we receive more uh, manuscripts than we can ever publish. And it does mean, however, uh, we are applying even more stringent criteria. And on this occasion, uh, we regret to inform you that your manuscript failed to uh, meet those criteria. So whatever said and done, it is important for, for the authors to accept the truth that they must actually plan, please try elsewhere. Um, the editor or the editorial team, sometimes the editor can actually pass it on. So there, there can be a process, you know, either it could be just the uh, chief editor or it could be a group of two or three editors um, have deemed the paper is actually not even worth peer review process. So, so, so this threshold is very, very important. If this is a pass, then only it goes to the editorial um, associate editors or, or different editors. Once the editorial review is okay, and your paper is not, not rejected at that stage, then the paper can be sent to peer reviewers through the associate editors, uh, depending on the journal. 
And depending on the type of manuscripts, it could be one, two, three, or even four um, um, uh, journals. Um, some journals send it out to many reviewers. Uh, one reason is that because uh, it is difficult to get quality reviews in uh, all the time. So, so by reaching out to more people, um, you know, it is, it is it, in a way it is helpful to get these reviews quickly. And also, um, uh, overall good reviews would also be um, much more frequent. And they are, of course, independent of the authors. Um, open versus blinded peer review. Uh, yes, there are some journals which advocate the use of open peer review, meaning both the authors and the editors um, and the reviewers uh, would know, um, um, uh, you know, who's doing what. Um, but at least a single blinded review for uh, you know most practical purposes actually uh, I believe is important. Um, blinded can be single blind, meaning uh, the reviewers know but uh, the authors don't, or it could be double blind, meaning nobody knows. Okay, very similar to randomized control trial, and all the systems have got their merits and demerits. Um, uh, but in smaller specialties um, and in some countries, uh, specifically, I would say in India, it is not at all a good idea to reveal the identity of the peer reviewers or even associate editors to the authors. They are asked to comment on the overall quality of the manuscript, um, uh, what is the scientific merit, uh, what is the style of writing, if anything is out of the way, unusually, and whether this manuscript's uh, needs to be prioritized in terms of publication is accepted. So a lot of things can be asked. Uh, in the, in the drop-down menus or, uh, you know, checkbox uh, menus, there will be option to, to comment on all of these for reviewers. But the basic outcome is, Two, one is comments to the authors. So these are open comments to the authors. So this could be a critical appraisal of your work. The peer reviewer may ask for clarification on some points. They may raise some questions related to the work um, uh, and the specific segments of your manuscript. And they can also suggest modifications to improve the the clarity um, and sharpen the focus of your manuscript. Whereas the confidential comments to the editor would have a checkbox menu where it will say accept major revision, minor revision, or reject. But most importantly, it will contain a free text box where the reviewers would put frank opinion about your paper. The key thing to understand is that whereas the comments to the authors would be diplomatic, um, the language uh, would be diplomatic and it should be diplomatic. Whereas uh, to, the, to the editor, the confidential comments can be really um, very frank and they would uh, decide uh, the ultimate fate of your paper. So don't be, um, you know, mess led by uh, the comments to the authors you see here, um, because no peer reviewer is going to say uh, in their direct comments to the authors that this manuscript may be rejected. But here, those frank opinion about the overall assessment of your paper will actually help guide the editor to make a final judgment about your paper. Okay, so let's say your paper has gone through a successful peer review and the outcome is you've been asked to revise. When revising, it is important to read the editor's letter very carefully. What actually is being asked? 
for you to uh, furnish. Well, we start by thanking the, when, when, when you have revised the manuscript according to uh, the reviewer's commands, it is important to thank the reviewers it is important to thank the reviewers. You remember, this is um, this is um, a voluntary work, okay, and uh, uh, they are uh, giving their uh, time and putting in effort voluntarily. Uh, so they must be thanked for 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 their efforts and inputs. And I think this is there is it is not a written rule, but I think you know this is basic decency which um, we should expect from our professional colleagues. Address each comment individually. Uh, if it is, uh, if you see a paragraph written by uh, the reviewer, it is important to break it down, break it down to comments and take each comment in turn and address it individually. Okay. And provide a, and this is often asked. So, so provide a marked, either highlighted or track changes and a clean revision. So both two sets of papers so that, so that, um, uh, so that uh, the, the reviewer uh, or the editor can actually um, uh, make a judge what has been actually done. So I'll just uh, stop sharing. I'll just show you some examples of, um, I'll just go to the different one. Okay, so uh, where is it? Give me a second. Okay, so this is an example of a peer review. Um, and this is, but but you can see that this is a fairly good quality review um, because right up front, the central question of your paper has been grasped by the reviewer. And just in three or four or five um, um, sentences, uh, the whole paper has been actually, um, you know, um, uh, bared out, okay? So, so the main criticism was regarding the exclusion and inclusion criteria, um, the selection of the trials, why something particularly was uh, uh, left out, and important from the US point of view, uh, view was to actually point towards the substantial heterogeneity in reporting of the outcomes. So, can see that you know he is actually saying in the last line, uh, which is which means that you know your manuscript is not going anywhere. Uh, based on above, I agree that rather than relying on this type of metalysis uh, in a in inverted commas, future large population based and long term studies should be further should further elucidate the changes in CFCFR predictions and all that. So here in the in the uh, review itself, there is enough pointer to the potential authors that, uh, you know, um, um, it is not probably going to uh, um, you know, be successful because you cannot actually change. Uh, there are some things, you know, which you really can't change. Okay. Now, Okay. 
India. So I showed this. Sorry about this, please just give me a second. Yeah. Okay. Now this is another example of um, um, uh, a short but very specific uh, review performed by a reviewer three years ago for some journal. And I was asked whether this is a good review or not. So that's how I got this with me. Okay. So is it is it being seen? Yes, it is visible. Right. Thank you. Okay. So here it says, you know, interesting study and says, you know, I would like to specifically know. Okay, I mean, he is okay with the whole manuscript. He has got three uh, points and very well made, you can see. So he, he wants to know specifically uh, that, you know, what are these? And the authors must provide, you know, what is a standard pre-biologic counseling in the USA because the authors have talked about it, but, you know, it's not being detailed anywhere. And then his final concerns were, the, the study over its steps in its brief and discussion and the title. So he wants the title and the discussion to be modified. And what he has said to the editor is good study needs a bit more clarity and less assertive title and discussion given the limitations. So, so you reviewers um, uh, do have their own style and very wide uh, variation in terms of uh, how they review. Uh, some reviewers like to take uh, bit by bit abstract introduction methods, results, discussion, and references. And then they will comment on the language and grammar, general style aspects, and then uh, they will make a final concluding uh, remark also. So, so those are, uh, again, I would say very good examples of how uh, the peer review uh, should be done. And the purpose is actually to actually help the author. You know, it's not, it's not um, the other way. Okay, and just one or two more examples. Okay, so now once you got the reviewers um, uh, feedback with you, uh, then comes the question of replying. So, so this is um, this is a reply, an example here. So this was a fairly uh, comprehensive um, uh, uh, review uh, for a manuscript, which uh, this is our own manuscript, uh, which we published two years ago. You can say that, you know, there is, so we always start by thanking the editor and the reviewers for their time and thoughtful comments. Okay, always do that as a matter of professional courtesy, if not anything more. Then, the, the review had uh, editors uh, review included. So you can see that point by point, you know, change that article category. Um, please add author contributions. So some technical bits here. Um, then omitting figure one is advisable. We did not do that, but we explained why we have not omitted figure one. Um, the question was about the copyright, and we further explained that. Uh, because we own the copyright and we have paid the full uh, you know, subscription that, and we are actually allowed to modify the images the way uh, we deem fit. Then taking up each reverse comment, breaking it down to several different things, you know, because so like, for example, it is said here, abstract is too short. Okay, abstract has been expanded. Then nothing is mentioned in the introduction of relevance of rheumatology except this statement mentioned by the authors. Okay, so what so we have to understand what is actually being said. What what is 
what what does peer reviewer wants to convey uh, to the author that has to be understood and 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 that has to be not only uh, replied to but also accordingly the manuscript has to be revised for example the structure has been made better because there was a question about it could be better structured um if a mistake has been committed like you can see it is not an appealing to promote uh, the for pharmaceutical companies in a review article and and this was a mistake so we apologize for this uh, error you know so where is possible uh, uh, stick to uh, your guns where uh, it is mandatory that you should change and revise you should um both instances should be supported by um, you know uh, your written text reviewer two said that there are a lot of references actually there are hardly any references from the traditional sources so we said um, the uh, the evidence is actually only uh, developing as far as the digital uh, health is concerned in rheumatology and that's why it is not surprising that most of the references were from the web sources because that's where this knowledge is coming and also i don't know what happened to that but i think i'll um stop that now i'll show you another example okay so um i'll just take this because i think this is quite interesting this is an example where um the reviewer wanted to basically change uh, the overall nature of the whole and as an author uh it was not acceptable to the to them um when we write a rebuttal at this stage um so you know i have said here rebuttal but no revision that is the example so here again start by thanking the editor and the reviewer for the time and effort and at the outset we are saying that why this manuscript was written because it was written with a view to inform the global readership of this journal because you can see that in the reviewers um a comments uh, there were two important things actually three one is lack of reflective criticism so you know that whenever a review article is written it is it, it is not just a statement of facts there has to be a degree of critical analysis critical appraisal and reflective criticism which that's how sort of you know it is different so other than saying we just highlighted that actually it is already there okay um we did not revise anything we did not revise the manuscript at all whenever a specific question was found like why is it that there is such a lot of interest in digital scribes in us but not in the uk or india so we said that you know with evidence that it is actually there in india um and actually it is one of the only what it is actually one of the potential solutions to a major limitation of the electronic health records and we said our review already discusses these aspects we did not revise anything then again you can see to be more successful this paper could become more focused on a smaller uh, geographical area so the 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 reviewer wanted us to focus just on india we said no we cannot we are not going to do that um we said focusing on a particular geography uh, would not do the justice to the countries and clinicians which are in various stages of adoption across uh, the world including asia africa and middle east so that was that so just sticking to the guns but you know why you are doing so is important the third uh, suggestion was to look at only a 
specific area of the EHR development, which is the electronic health records development in a more critical way. Again, we said we had done that in specialty journals where, uh, you know, this was the digital health paper, which earlier I referred to. And this is the most, a more recent one where we looked at the emerging role of e-health. So this is a special, these are the specialty journals where that type of approach is much more useful, but not for this journal, which is actually meant for the, um, I meant for uh, the general physicians. So um, this, this, this is an example of a rebuttal, but no revision. So we are looked at, um, you know, reviews, example of a couple of short, but good reviews. Uh, then we looked at um, an example of uh, how to reply to the US comments. Uh, then we further looked, looked into um, how a rebuttal, but without any revision can be uh, constructed. And in between, uh, there can be instances of um, where you, your response uh, is being combined with rebuttal. That can also be a, um, uh, an example. So let me go back to my presentation. Sorry about all this mix up. Yeah. Okay. So once the review has been done, what are the outcomes? Okay. One possible outcome could be that the editors um, um, send it back to the reviewers and they come back to you with further clarification um, and need for another revision. That is perfectly all right because your manuscript is still in the game. It may happen that the editors uh, uh, ask the reviewers and the reviewers are not happy with the revisions taken. They have pointed out that there are several areas which still remain uh, clarified and uh, not appropriately addressed or addressed. And in their opinion, there is no point for the revision. So that would be review and reject. Then of course, based on, uh, after having a look at the revised manuscript the, at the editorial level, uh, it can be deemed for uh, an outright rejection. So all these three uh, possible outcomes are very much possible. But let me come to the most important aspect of my talk, that is how to deal with the rejections. Um, dealing with rejections are not easy. And culturally, um, in India, I don't think uh, we know how to deal with rejections. And I would say that this is a cultural issue because this has not been my experience uh, working for uh, international journals or you know, when I uh, um, reject manuscripts coming from uh, those countries. And this is a very, very specific issue. That's why I said that the peer reviewers should be protected uh, by concealing their identity, uh, specifically if it, if it is India, because I don't think we are emotionally mature uh, to deal with rejections. It hurts to be rejected, particularly when authors perceive themselves to be academically superior. It does not matter where they are based, whether in institutes or in India, as they say, you know, private practice. And they feel insulted that, oh, this editor or this journal has rejected my manuscripts. Overall, I feel that actually demonstrates poor emotional impact of uh, those authors. Not any comment on their academic merit or the quality of science uh, they have tried to contribute to the particular journal, but their, their mere response, um, you know, uh, often avoidable and totally objectionable, but alludes to the fact that they are not emotionally mature. And also it highlights that they have lack of understanding and process about the process and the issues related to how uh, the manuscripts decision related decisions are made. 
in the last eight, nine years, um, we had two uh, major experiences. Uh, one I still remember was a, was a review article and it was reviewed by not one, not two, but three past editors of the journal. Universally, uh, unanimously, the verdict was this is so poor that it should be rejected outright. This is the second example was um, again uh, a group of reviews where again not one but four editors were involved and the editorial board unanimously uh, decided that you know, those set of reviews are totally um, you know, substandard and does not, are not in keeping with the high standards of the journey. So this is fine, but in both instances, the subsequent response of authors or author in question actually highlights uh, all the things I have discussed in this particular slide. So what is important for the authors to realize that actually it's not about them, you know, a rejection of a manuscript is actually not about them. There can be several different reasons for a manuscript to be rejected. And we had discussed uh, this aspect in the last uh, uh, you know, four sessions of uh, this workshop. A right from poor science to poor writing to tall claims, okay, and simply a manuscript out being out of the scope of the journal, the reasons can be many. But what is important is for the authors to develop a mechanism to deal with the rejection. And you know, just prep yourself up. Um, uh, you know, uh, maybe you want to see a life guide, you know, uh, which is called life intervention guide or life help guide, you know. Uh, who can give you some moral and ethical and emotional support to deal with rejection. But most important for the authors is to actually puncture themselves the bloated egos and try to reduce the perceived self-worth. That is most, most important because that is actually clouding um, uh, how you are behaving, <laughs> how you ought to behave uh, professionally. And look at where you stand on the global scale of things. Authors believe that my paper has no faults and they always blame the editors um, or reviewers. But look, the world perceives uh, uh, this is the worth of your paper. Reviewers are a bit generous than the, you know, the, the overall world as a whole. Editors take actually very sympathetic view towards your paper. Okay. They see that it has got a lot of issues, but okay, let, let this paper come in. So if you, if, if in my experience of, you know, out of more than 2000 manuscripts, I might have handled as the editor in chief, these two journals, whatever. I would say every time if I had stuck to the reviewers' uh, recommendations or the, my associate editor's recommendation, then the, the rejection rate would have been close to 90%. But because it is 50 to 60%, you can see that um, uh, you know it, this is not true, and definitely the editors and reviewers are not helpful to the authors. This is not. What is important is I uh, again highlight to the uh, you know to the listeners is that actually the editors reviewers are custodian of science and don't let stay examples of you know um, that some sort of you know article getting into the way getting uh, you know getting published where you doubt uh, the veracity the quality. Uh, they are stay examples at its best. It is possible that some may have slipped through the net. And it is agreed that peer review is a slow process, but fast does not mean always uh, you know, good. And then, especially now, 
um, self advertising or off useless research do you do you approve and similarly um, placing and advertising it in an inappropriate way uh, the non peer reviewed stuff uh, is it do you think it is morally and ethically justified doctor we know uh, sorry for interruption i think uh, yeah, has some to... urgent work yeah 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 I last slide. sorry yes. sorry for interrupting you yeah yeah last slide so anyway it is a voluntary work and it helps the science move and knowledge flow and the simulation and assessment by the end user is subjective and not uniform so it is important that next time before you decline a request or peer review because you are busy think and before you raise a hue and cry about delay in processing of your manuscript think and before you submit a substandard or one line review think and before you explain how did they publish this particular piece uh, think because i think we are all uh, uh, you know a part of this process and we all have to do our best if your manuscript is rejected you have the option you can try other journal without revision you try other journal after revising taking reviews previously performed reviews into account or ask a non author colleague to give honest opinion or just give up because if there are fatal flaws it does not matter how many journals you are going to go through and construct a rebuttal if at all you want If you want to write a rebuttal, shun emotionalism. No place and avoid ramblings and ranting. Just stick to the scientific merit of your paper. Gently suggest that you know some of the important aspects you think are important have, might have been overlooked, and avoid criticizing reviewers and editors. Even after you write a rebuttal against rejections, uh, please be prepared that the decision may still be offered. Okay. So now. after all this if your uh, uh, submission is accepted for publication well congratulations on my and my team's behalf thank you very much thank you dr ravindran for the detailed lecture now we'll move on to dr durga the last talk of today which will detail how research is going to change in the times to come over to dr durga hello good evening is my connection stable are you, are you able to hear me yes we are able to hear you uh, please go ahead yeah good evening so I, i shall just have a brief presentation on research in the post covid era basically principles that were taken for granted with regards to ethics overview with regards to consent but they do not become so much feasible in this era of covid social distancing etc so it shall be a very brief presentation and i shall just overview the principles of ethical principles in the context of covid 19 research and what are covid 19 specific databases so how do you do ethics committee in times of social distancing how do you ensure adherence to ethical practices how do you ensure consent how do you collect samples for analysis from covid-19 patients and how do you ensure safety of healthcare workers involved in research and what about non covid research during these times so these are some of the ideas that i shall touch upon fortunately our indian council of medical research apart from doing so much uh, work on covid has published a national guidelines for ethics committees reviewing biomedical and health research during covid-19 pandemic and this is the document that i shall refer to it's available free of cost on the icmr website so i would suggest that those of you interested in more details could please download this document and have a look so here basically they recognize the emergency circumstances that have rendered participants vulnerable to be coerced to participate patients with covid-19 may not have access to formal or informal support they are in the hospital isolated alone away from their families and social distancing norms may not facilitate conventional methods of data collection or alternative study designs might be required such as online or remote methods to conduct interviews focus groups surveys or questionnaires 
and social media research is something which Dr. Latika has extensively talked about and is gaining much more relevance in these times. For obtaining quality data, verification of identity of research participants is another challenge. In a clinic, you are seeing the participant face to face, but here you are exchanging information at the best electronically. So you need to be careful and include security measures in your data collection tools and identifying information may be collected if you are doing online based surveys. So this might also require review by the ethics committee on a case to case basis. Overall, with respect to surveys, particularly surveys of educational practices, the Indian Council of Medical Research is very categorical that you do not need a full ethics committee overview. You just require a exemption from review. You need to inform the ethics committee that you're doing this study and more or less they would just not take it up for review and give you an exemption from review. So now there are three categories of research, new research directly related to COVID-19, ongoing non-COVID research and new non-COVID research. So again, the ethics committee has to prioritize prioritize research review based on urgency and take needful steps to facilitate review of new research and also conduct ongoing research with needful amendments, keeping in mind social distancing norms. And this could be done by meeting through video conference and, or WhatsApp calls or Zoom calls like we are right on, on right now. Ethics committee should ensure that all COVID-19 related research that are clinical trials are registered on the Clinical Trials Registry of India with appropriate approvals as usual. And member secretary might categorize proposals into exempt or expedited or full review category as per ethical guidelines and may plan to fast track their peer review, uh, a review of the ethics committee application so that uh, research can be done and important information which can potentially save lives can be shared as fast as possible. Again, expedited review and scheduled full review committee meetings can be done on a case to case basis depending on the urgency. And virtual or tele web conferences should be attempted. Face to face can be avoided to observe social distancing norms. And preliminary research procedures sometimes may be permitted to be started, particularly if they are low risk, like they are limited to just anonymized data, bi biological sample collection and where members of local ethics committees are unavailable, such research may be conducted by any other ethics committee within the country for initiating the study until the local ethics committee is able to convene its meeting. And the principles, the ethical issues related to reviewing a protocol remain as usual. What are the social values, scientific design and conduct of the study, review of informed consent process, benefit risk assessment, selection recruitment of participants, qualification and adequacy of study sites, and particularly in clinical trials, whether you have any payment for the participants, what are the community considerations, what are the plans for medical management and compensation for study related injury, what are your conflicts of interest and how do you protect privacy confidentiality. These are the usual measures and these remain the same. So again, virtual meetings should be planned and should be kept short and the ethics committee may decide to meet more frequently say for fast tracking proposals within uh, that are submitted so that you can have uh, a quick decision in one or two days. During the review process, the ethics committee needs to consider whether written consent is possible. If not possible, say patient is in physical isolation, then consent could be given orally or you could use electronic methods to document this. However, the ethics committee must be aware of such electronic methods. Ongoing study, the principal investigator may be indisposed for a period. These are very uncertain times. So they may need to delegate parts of the study temporarily to other co-investigators. And this should be documented and reported to the ethics committee at the earliest. And therefore, uh, in, it is important to share information during such a public health emergency. And all efforts should be made to publish the relevant information so that people can benefit from it. Meetings could be digitally recorded with permission of members and attendance could be noted online rather than through the conventional methods of signing uh, once you attend a meeting. Multicentric research is another challenge, but here the ICMR says that you could have a common review of multicentric research to be carried out by one main designated ethics committee for fast track decision making. 
and non covid research if it is important to not forget about non covid research particularly that related to treatments for chronic diseases or other non communicable or communicable diseases and these must also be taken up by the ethics committee on priority as usual and not just relegated to the background because of the covid 19 pandemic informed consent we had already discussed the elements of informed consent remain the same but one can use electronic consent in these times however you need to document the process possibly through audio or video recording and inform the ethics committee that such electronic consent shall be obtained waiver of consent can be done in the usual circumstances like retrospective studies de-identified participants anonymized biological samples or data can also be taken for waiver of consent during the covid-19 pandemic so that's important for researchers who are working on covid-19 and then i mean with all the fatalities that we are having with this terrible disease we may not be able to contact the patient back so even such anonymized biological samples can be potentially permitted for use by the ethics committee because they could help give important information about this disease but you may not be able to obtain the usual informed consent and patients with covid-19 are a vulnerable population and so also are the healthcare workers in covid-19 hospitals and this must be kept in mind during consent process also safety of healthcare workers involved in covid-19 research the safety of healthcare workers must not be jeopardized either to get the sample or to process the sample or to take the informed consent and prioritize research and schedules to prevent overcrowding adequate training appropriate biosafety measures when dealing with biological samples expose minimum number of researchers communication using electronic platforms due protective gear as per the norms and facilities should have protective gear before they undertake research and of course safety against any assault from public and others insurance cover for clinical trials as usual but you must prioritize the safety of the healthcare workers involved in the research in collection of samples and taking consent in dealing with the samples now coming to a slightly unrelated topic uh, the medline has established this site called as lit covid which collates all the literature related to covid-19 that is available on a pubmed search so you can for example you could search about a particular agent and you could get all the information from the site the up to date information and this is particularly useful for researchers in the time of covid-19 as you can see publications related to covid-19 over a period of time from january it has peaked about mid may and now it is continuing at this peak in line with the pandemic peaking all across the world and as you can see a lot of research on covid-19 is being done from the area where it originated countries which have been greatly affected by it and we are also contributing significantly to research on covid-19 and these uh, colored areas are the ones that have published papers in lit covid on covid-19 so i would suggest that those of you who are interested in covid-19 who are managing patients with covid-19 go and look at this lit covid site and follow it regularly to identify updates in the specialty so the world of research shall never be the same circa 2020 unfortunately as for most things in the world we are going to enter a new world post covid whenever it ends and norms of ethics committee approval and informed consent have changed and consider referring to specialist bibliographic databases for up to date information on covid-19 with this i'd like to conclude and any questions are most welcome uh durga hello hello yes yes uh, yeah, i just uh, i can hear you latika can i ask one question please first ah uh, yes sir i can hear you yeah uh you know the um, what about um the ethical uh, reviews you know 
because ethics committees in many institution they meet quarterly and uh, uh, with the type of fast tracking demand for these manuscripts um, for the studies i mean how what's happening uh, in those areas you know what is what is being done? Uh, like what's so happening that... in your institute i had to ask you for example uh sir i think after i answer this probably vikas sir can add a little bit to the frustration that we are facing with respect to these kind of things okay. but uh, they are doing their best they are trying to meet and prioritize uh, covid 19 related research but definitely more can be done uh, would vikas sir like to take this up uh, yeah actually uh, i don't know about the uh, other institutes but what we are facing is any basic research related to covid is getting an expedited review but the problem is with the some kind of a clinical studies to try out some drug then you need to wait for maybe 4 to 6 weeks okay okay yeah okay so okay. i can add a little bit more i sit on several uh, ethics committees i have been member of ethics committee or um, institutional ethics committee for the past few years um i think most of the ethics committees have keyed up and geared up to the present situation in fact uh, both the ethics committees where i sit on are doing uh, uh, virtual meetings and our turnaround rate for uh, expedited review is about 2 to 3 days once the proposal is submitted we send it out for review it's reviewed and it comes back and this uh, in we are approving after corrections in 2 to 3 days at the earliest also if the author keeps up on it most of the ethics committees are keyed up to it and are geared up to it it's whether it's covid or not covid it doesn't uh, really matter depending upon the importance of, of the research and the need for fast tracking it uh, in fact uh, a lot of non covid proposals have also gone through our ethics committee uh, but then the problem is that where are the patients most of the hospitals are functioning in uh, revised modes or situations where they are not having uh, a lot of non covid patients at all yeah i think it varies from institution to institution and from ethics committee to ethics committee so difficult to say but i think they are doing their best everywhere so dr goel dr mohit goel has this question he says none of the ethics committee in his city has had a meeting since march so so which city are you from mohit uh it's from udaipur so udaipur uh, definitely what none of the ethics committees in my city is a very broad statement and depends upon what institutions are there in that uh, city which i may not be familiar with however i am sure they have a medical college there and some of the ethics committees uh, of course would have to meet in virtual space to pass uh, uh, or to approve the uh, proposals otherwise there is definitely no way forward there are no meetings happening in the very near future at all so dr sabrinath has asked if ethical clearance is required for phone based interviews yes you require an exemption from review as per the icmr guidelines uh, which is a tiny document you just need to uh, uh, attach the survey and mention the purpose so depends if it is an audit of uh, practices and if it's completely anonymized the data handling has to be specified so it's a much shorter do document than a routine uh, ethics permissions and uh, it can be easily taken but it is mandatory to publish in any good journal so you cannot uh... decide whether your proposal is fit or not for exemption for review you just request the ethics committee and it's the ethics committee's decision whether to exempt you or not to exempt you so uh, you still have to apply to the ethics committee whatever their decision has to be uh, then uh, respected any more questions so uh, let me ask uh, latika so the uh, what do you think you know is uh, because i think uh, 
at the end of uh, the talk uh, related to social media i am a bit confused actually which way the scientific publications are going i mean what what is in your uh, you know view going to happen to the medical academy publishing i say this because we always say what is the most important thing in clinical medicine which is still actually the physical examination and attempt to arrive at a diagnosis yes. so certain gold standards cannot be uh, sort of you know taken away so now especially related to covid uh, probably because of this physical limitation of you know a lot of things as we discussed today there is being uh, you know uh, slightly i think i would say that um, um unwanted perhaps uh, uh, focus on social media outreach as the word which is used so where does it lead who is going to judge the quality are the authors within their right you know and here i would say morally and ethically to promote their non peer reviewed research because i think that is the major contention now i mean so what i gather from your question is one the quality of research and second is the methods of research right if i got it right so no 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 ladiga uh, uh, it's a social media i mean you know so social media is a tool where uh, you know all the so see one one aspect is uh, we have said that even after peer review or you know the limitations of peer review uh, the articles are being published and the second aspect is social media has become a tool where all type of research or uh, any piece of written word is being promoted by everybody so where is the moral and ethical justification of uh, you know doing so uh, in our traditional world right so i This... think you're talking about preprints so preprints are uh, uh, really uh... the fashion these days in covid times a lot of people are uploading their research before it's been formally published anywhere and before it's undergone peer review on to preprint archives uh, like we had also a lot of papers on the genetics which uh, of covid which uh, were talked about and some of these papers can be removed after that it's very convenient to remove them so that is the research you're talking about yes definitely uh, we are seeing all kinds of research being promoted because these are uh, times of adversity and uh, Uh, you have to take them with a pinch of salt if they've not undergone peer review um but a sizable number of those articles will undergo peer review and will be published subsequently so it all depends on what kind of study it is and whether it's published later but sometimes it can be useful i wouldn't junk it all together but uh thinking that everything on social media is a uh, a preprint or has not undergone peer review is a bit of a stretch because most of the research which is being circulated in academic circles is a published research and uh, the alt metrics we talk about is published research where it is cited cited like not in terms of papers but the other portals so the importance that can make more that is what we were discussing about but i think that still carries a lot of relevance because the lay public is also important and their uh, usage of certain uh, scientific findings is something that deserves mention now let me also add further to that uh, question because i i can see where dr ravindran's comment is coming from uh, especially because he's a journal editor himself and he needs to see uh, look forward where it is going so in in the covid time my understanding has been that a lot of information has circulated through a non formal channel of the social media which was not uh, the case earlier however uh, in the future what i can see uh, happening is easily that uh, the formal journals which are available will be much less or would not be able to meet the demand uh, that is required for publication which is already happening i have realized in my own career that it was 
very much easier to publish about five to six years ago, but it has become uh, extremely difficult to publish anything even decently written in the current times unless you are willing to pay uh, for publication charges or processing fee. So in the times to come, I can see that uh, the demand is going to be far greater than the supply in terms of formal uh, journals which are available. So a lot more people are going to take up to social media for uh, articles which they are not able to publish or not uh, uh, able to publish very quickly. And most of these are going to be lapped up or accepted by a, a ready audience, which uh, is not very uh, keen to wait for a formal publication and is willing to accept the information as it is coming. We saw a glimpse of this in the COVID times because a lot of information was circulated and accepted and applied even before it was uh, uh, going through a process of peer review at different uh, editorial processes. So my take would be that every journal should be ready to promote their own case and cause through a social media channel as well on different platforms depending upon their acceptability and their ability which should include articles beyond and over what they are for, uh, coming out in a published space. So like saying that if they were starting off with a print version and then had to move on to a website, it's time that they move on to social media. Sorry, should stop. Yes, definitely there's, uh, uh, it is important to regulate all this flux of information and uh, reduce misinformation. So we need uh, portals where it, where it can be regulated and uh, everything is curated, checked, and then delivered to the lay public. That is definitely important. We have a few more questions. Uh, Dr. Rita Asman has asked uh, what that case series are not mentioned in many journals, in which category they should be submitted. So a lot of journals, uh, accept them as case reports, up to five cases, most of the journals count as case reports and case series together, while uh, the journal specifics can vary as well. So you need to uh, go through their instruction to authors to know more. Um, there is one more question. What is the difference between a concise report and letter to the editor? So it's usually the word limit. A concise report for most journals is 1,500 to 2,000 words, while a letter to the editor for most of the journals is 400 to a maximum stretch of 800, sometimes 1,000, if you're lucky. So that's a huge difference. So in a letter, uh, it need not always have original data, while a concise report is usually original data and original research. Although you can sometimes publish uh, smaller pieces of inter uh, original research as letter to the editor. Then uh, Dr. Mohit Goyal is saying, can studies requiring full review be dealt with in virtual meetings of ethics committees? Yes, uh, at our institute, uh, at SGBGI, most of the meetings have been virtual until now. So uh, yes, they can be taken up for a full review, but it depends how many panelists are available. And many committees are uncertain about this. I guess it varies from uh, institute uh, to institute and also the cities. Guidance is as per what Dr. Durga told. Maybe you'd like to touch upon, I, I think Dr. Durga has left, but yes, as per the ICMR document, we can go about it. And uh, you may refer to that for further details. Any further questions? All right, uh, then it was great meeting all of you uh, over these sessions. And if you have any queries, uh, please feel free to write to us. Uh, we will be sending you a feedback form shortly. Thank you and good night. <laughs>